Okay, good evening, everybody. My name is Jürgen Steinmetz. I'm joining you from Livestream and Rebuilding.Travel in Honolulu. And uh, with me is Edward Sun. He's our guest today, and uh, he will have a lot to talk about a little bit later. You see him also here in Hawaii. And I wanted to recognize and maybe say hello, and you can say a few words if you like. It's uh, Cuthbert Nikubi. He's uh, joining us from South Africa, and he's the um, as many of you know, he's the uh, chairman of the African Tourism Board. Let me, before we start, get everyone on mute. And then those, uh, if you participate and speak, what we welcome, you can raise your hand and then unmute yourself. Uh, so it would avoid background noise here. So I, I'll do that right now. Let me just. Okay. Okay, Cut Cutbert, can you unmute yourself? I muted you too. Okay, there he is. Okay, so let me get him on there. Okay, again, <laughs> good morning, uh, Cuthbert. How's everything in South Africa? Very well, again, and love the weather indeed. And as the activation of our travel sector, we're definitely looking forward for a more robust recovery. Yeah, I think that's that's what we all need. How's the situation with uh, uh, Corona right now in, in South Africa? Look, well, when you look at the recovery versus the, the, the affected uh, individuals, that's where then you realize that the trend is quite very good. We've been spared, especially in Africa in terms of the numbers. They are not as scary as that. And yes, of course, we 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 we, we're getting messages of the second, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, affection of, of, of the pandemic, but uh, we really appreciate that uh, Africa has been really spared this gauge. And you, you're getting into the summer, while the rest of the world, on the northern uh, half of the world at least, is getting into the winter. So that should help with, uh, with your exposure, I think, right? Oh, yes, definitely, definitely. Yeah, so let's 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 hope for the best and all work together. Um, Talib, uh, he said he's trying to get in. He may have some some uh, issues. So what I do, I think we can just start. And when Talib gets in, I will recognize him. And here's someone else who wanted to our guy from Saudi Arabia. He said I'm supposed to send him. Let me just send him the link. Okay. I'm, I'm so, so glad everyone speaks English because. Um, uh, I see Nepal and Croatia and everybody else online. That's, that's pretty incredible. Yes, um, yeah, yeah. Now we have, we have people from all over the world. Actually, believe it or not, Edward, we now have 120 countries in our group. Wow. Um, we just added our last country last week, and this was in, uh, uh, San Marino. Do you know where San Marino is? No, I don't. See, see, there's a country. <laughs> so uh, San Marino is, is a very small country. It's like a more like a city on the rock. It's close to Rimini, in, uh, surrounded by Italy, but it's one of the oldest independent republics in the world, I believe. And wow. uh, we have the foreign minister who joined us, who I actually know, I know him for many, many years, so he finally um, joined us. So we're probably going to have a session also on San Marino, and they have been hit very hard with Corona. Actually, in the global statistic, when Corona started, San Marino was always on the top. Uh, in numbers and in uh, outbreaks, but of course you it's it's uh, only a few people, but it was very uh, very bad. But anyways, Edward, uh, welcome, aloha. You're here from my neighborhood uh, in Hawaii, and um, I think like we did this morning, the best way to introduce yourself is if, if you introduce yourself <laughs> and <laughs> let us know what okay. you're doing. Um, again, welcome. I let you start. Okay, okay. Well, in very atypical Asian style, I'll make a few comments about my background and then we'll start into a presentation. And um, I have about a, I guess a 45, 50 minute presentation on some technical ways that we can open up successfully, okay, uh, recovering from a pandemic. So uh, the topic is how to open uh, successfully from pandemic for travel and also how to create safe bubbles between countries. So that's our topic tonight. Uh, my background is uh, born, born and raised in Hawaii. Uh, in fact, I was named after Prince Edward Street in Waikiki. So 
So my parents lived in Waikiki. And um, I'm an electrical engineer, uh, worked in the industry, and uh, ended up doing some interesting things with uh, the government for Homeland Security, as well as for um, some of the uh, uh, trade industry. Uh, one of the people that helped start a company called Verifone. And um, I think that's used worldwide today for point of sale, uh, retail, and uh, worked for years in uh, telecommunications. And we have a company in Hawaii called Sun Global Broadband. Uh, we're happily located in Manoa Valley, uh, about uh, 20 minutes from the Waikiki Beach area. And we're uh, situated on beautiful University of Hawaii uh, Innovation Center. So um, and that's a brief background. And um, I'm gonna talk from experience today and talk about some of the things we've done to create what I would call a safe travel bubble for Hawaii, as well as um, uh, what type of relationships we've been able to create uh, between countries so that we can convert ourselves from what was a smart city strategy to um, uh, basically to uh, a smart uh, travel bubble. So, um, and Edward, if Edward. I can maybe just uh, briefly interrupt sure. and, and, yeah. and also I will introduce Talib who's just getting in. Okay. And, uh, uh, and the reason we actually do this, and I know we don't um, have that many people here from Hawaii because we had a session this morning, but it's not just about Hawaii. We're giving this as an example to the world. And I think if this concept works here, it could work and it probably would work anywhere else. And it's, it's an interesting discussion. But uh, before we uh, now move on, I wanted to just recognize real quick, uh, Dr. Talib Rifai. Um, he's joining us from Spain, I believe, even though he lives in uh, Amman, right. jo Jordan. And uh, for those that don't know this, and uh, I know Edward, you're not that much in this part of the world. He's one of the, I would say the most known celebrities in the world when it comes to travel and tourism. He was the secretary general for the UNWTO, the United Nations World Tourism Organization for two terms. And uh, before that, he was minister of tourism in Jordan and uh, uh, is a good friend and a co-host uh, for us. And so, so I'm very happy and very glad uh, you're here, Taleb. Good morning. Good morning to you. It's beautiful to see the beautiful Hawaii behind you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes. How are you? <laughs> So good, uh, good morning, nice Mr. Caleb. It's a real pleasure, and uh, thank you. It's thank a privilege you. to be online with you. Yeah, I said, you. just uh, to fill you real in, Edward is here in Honolulu, and he has developed a plan um, for Hawaii um, to establish travel bubbles, what he called safely. His his background is telecommunication, and uh, he worked also with Homeland Security, and um, is. Uh, explaining a system what's a little bit involved so it takes a little bit more time than our usual settings but it's quite fascinating so uh, <laughs> okay Edward I'm sorry go, go on okay sure so uh, anyway welcome everyone and uh, it's still early evening in Hawaii and it's early morning for some of you so I want to thank you for joining and I want to thank you um, Jurgen for inviting me to uh, participate with the um, the Rebuilding Travel Program. So uh, let me go ahead and put up a, a PowerPoint that I wanted to present today. And, um, you know, it's, um, it's a privilege to live in Hawaii. And also from Hawaii, it's a privilege to be able to see other parts of the world. Um, what I'm showing here is beautiful Waikiki Beach. Uh, in the background is a mountain called Diamond Head. Uh, named after, uh, in Diamond Head actually is where Civil Defense is located, uh, which is the fusion center for Homeland Security. Um, but as you can see, Waikiki Beach is uh, lush, uh, white sand beaches, blue skies, and um, one of the most visited places in the world for vacation tourist spots. And, and maybe today, uh, just for everyone to know, Hawaii opened up. Today was our very first day that we're allowing tourists to come back to our islands. And uh, so we're all kind of bracing to see what happens in the next two weeks. Um, we're very uh, careful about this. Yes, and I hope um, there are, we have tests. Uh, you have to come here with a uh, negative test, not with a positive test, with a negative test. And there's a second random test also, so it's quite strict. In the meantime, uh, we're also talking to Japan 
uh, on a travel bubble. So what Edward is presenting today is quite timely. Okay, go. I'm yeah. sorry. Good. Good. In fact, we have some of our partners from Japan uh, who just logged on just now. So I want to welcome them as well. Uh, anyway, today we're talking about uh, how to create a safe travel bubble. Now, of course, with the pandemic and COVID-19, the ideal is to get vaccine, you know, a vaccination available for everyone. Uh, and then also the ideal is to do testing uh, before travel and uh, on the way home. But I'm going to talk today about beyond the vaccination and, and the testing, what can we do to make sure that we create a safe environment for tourists and travelers? Now, um, the elements of safe travel bubble, uh, number one is vaccination, of course. And I think um, uh, the US and other countries are working very hard day and night to come up with this vaccine. And I heard that they really uh, did a remarkable job in trying to get something out within one year, which is remarkable. Um, also, we also are encouraging coming to Hawaii is pre-travel testing. And then there's also talk about the importance of during travel testing and then post travel testing. And that's really to ensure that uh, while you're here for the typical 10 day stay, that when you're heading back to your home destination, that you're safe to get on the plane on the way back. Um, of course, from Asia to Hawaii, it's between you know, five and 10 hours flight. Um, last time I was going to London was a 19 hour flight with transits in different, uh, different airports. So everything to Hawaii, when you're coming to Hawaii, is basically via airline. Uh, number three, we're going to talk about a little bit about tracing, okay? And what's involved with tracing, and then we'll talk a little bit about tracking. And um, I separated the two because they're really two different functions. And I'll explain more as we go to the slide. But the, in the tracking, we're talking about how to track in, in different types of bubbles, okay? And there's four types that I'll talk about here. So um, what's the benefit of a safety bubble? And the idea was um, that if we created something that was basically an area that people could feel safe and secure and alleviate the fears of traveling somewhere and getting sick, that it would um, give, encourage them to, you know, to travel again, because we've been locked down for a number of months. So number one, we want to reopen safely so we can stay open. We want to re-energize business for profitability and morale. We want to create a safe environment for employees and employers. And that's very important. And then, um, of course, nowadays, um, the, the pandemic has forced people to be more digitally efficient, right? We're using Zoom where in the past, maybe we would have had a conference somewhere. And then lastly is uh, leadership and data and analytics and how to build ecosystems. So is, essentially we have to learn to be more productive, okay, while we're remote. And Edward, I'm not sure if you uh, think you're sharing something. So far you're not sharing anything. Okay. Let me go back and make sure I share that. Sorry about that. No, no problem. Okay. There we go. Yeah, let me start here again. One of the good things about technology is you can always rewind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is uh, this is the picture of Diamond Head that I was talking to you about. Okay, and uh, you know that's where the civil defense is in that cr in this mountain in the background. Okay, in this crater. Actually, before it was civil defense, uh, we used to have rock concerts in there. Okay, so uh, it's a famous place for uh, people to still hike there. Uh, but that's where civil defense is today. Of course, this is Waikiki Beach. Um, I was talking about safe travel bubbles, and we'll, we'll discuss that today. And these were the elements of the safe travel bubble that I mentioned, vaccination and pre-travel testing, post-travel testing, during travel testing, and then the separation of tracing and tracking, okay? And what I put up here was the comprehensive safety bubble elements, okay? Uh, so why do this? What's the benefit of a safety bubble? Um, and it really was number one, how to be resilient when we open, because we don't want to reopen and then close, right? 
it's uh, it's more disruptive to business, to business, uh, tourism, as well as to the traveler. Uh, we also want to re-energize businesses. We want to provide safe environment for residents, employees, and travelers. We want to have digital efficiency, and we want to provide, you know, enhanced data analytics for us to be more um, efficient in a remote world. Okay, so what's involved or what's needed to build a safe travel bubble? Well, you know, good things don't come for free, right? So there's always a cost for that. So we're always seeking ways or partners to partner with us so that we can increase business, okay? And at the same time, um, we're all looking for ways that we can develop the platforms to get additional funding to build these bubbles. Second thing is we look for sponsor teams to develop um, rewards programs as well as safety programs that we can there license and share throughout the world. Here's a really important part for the travel industry is how we coordinate with hotels, restaurants, and the airline industry, okay? Because every part of that is a critical piece of the traveler experience. And then lastly, we have uh, marketing partners um, because one of the key things is that we've been living in fear for a number of months now, and we have to actually get out to the marketplace and entice and encourage people that it's now safe to travel. So the vision for Sun Global Broadband, our original vision was to uh, serve the Japanese tourists coming to Waikiki, okay? And we built that as a pilot system, as a model for the rest of the world. And then also with our alliances with different, um, you know, telecom groups across the world, also to build smart city for Hawaii, okay? And we can also license and model that across the world as well. So of course, one of Part of our relationships is with Japan for the Tokyo Olympics, okay? And um, the goals for 2020 is somewhat changed. Originally, the goal was to open up, and this is supposed to be our banner year for the 2020 Olympics. Uh, however, with pandemic striking in, in March of this year, first quarter, the goal shifted um, from, from something where we're going to actually do a smart city joint venture with other companies. It shifted to that we were shut down. And now the goal is to how to reopen Hawaii, which we did today, how to save lives with automated technology based on a pandemic, and how to save businesses who are involved in the travel industry. So these are some of the stakeholders from Hawaii that were involved. We have the picture of the mayor, picture of the governor, picture of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, uh, some of the stakeholders throughout the community. And I think a, a movement like this needs involvement from the community, okay? So um, I'm gonna start off with what's the issue? Why doesn't people just jump on a plane today? Hawaii open for business today. Why, don't, why aren't they coming? Well, I think that we have to retrain them into understanding that Hawaii is now a safe place just like in South Africa, is that a safe place to travel today? We actually have to get the word out. So number one, um, the inhibitors that people currently feel about travel, they've been told to stay home for seven months in Hawaii. Number two, people have been told not to trust public transportation. In fact, my son-in-law works for a um, notable engineering firm in Hawaii. And his companies told him that if you catch the bus to work, you cannot come into the office, okay? So people have been concerned about public transportation. Of course, if you're flying to Hawaii from Japan, uh, that's a seven to eight hour flight. And you're in a closed environment with um, a couple hundred other people all breathing the same air, okay? So that's an issue. How do we make sure that's safe? Okay, other parts. Um, how do we ensure that people from different countries coming to Hawaii don't catch COVID-19 from each other? And then how do we ensure that people quarantined here will get treated properly, okay, with the right, right health um, uh, treatment? And then how do they get home if they're contaminated? 
And then we have other things like assuring a safe work environment for employees, employers. And here's the other thing that's no, you know, some people don't even think about is if you have a business in jeopardy because of COVID-19, insurance does not cover that. Okay, it's not like your business was hit by a hurricane or fire and that's insurable. It, there's no insurance for pandemic. So there's a number of issues why people are concerned about travel. So the idea was, how do we build a safe travel bubble to deal with those issues? Okay, because if you don't deal with those issues, no one will no one will visit. And for Hawaii, that's eighty percent of our economy. So we are desperately wanting to open up and stay resilient. So I just put this up here, okay, and it's kind of a flow chart of sorts. Um, to show what are the steps for what we feel is, um, get, you know, assures people that when they come here, they'll be safe to go home. So if we look at um, 30 days out, they'll book their travel, okay? Next, they'll download a safe travel app, which turns on some type of traffic and allows them to be enrolled into a, uh, you know, a, an application that uh, can assure them that their health records and so forth can be updated regularly during their trip. Next part is they should, to come into Hawaii, they're required to take a 72 or a COVID test 72 hours before travel and it must be negative. Okay. Um, if they don't take the test, they have to go through a 14 day quarantine when they arrive in Hawaii. When they get to the airport, they activate the COVID-19 tracking uh, um, uh, ID on your phone, okay? Most people have iPhones or Androids, so both of those phones have a COVID-19 tracker. And then when they arrive, okay, um, typically what I would, what they recommend is taking another COVID test. Now, if this normal stay is 10 days, there is a likelihood that someone could collect or could get COVID-19 while they're here, okay? Because I don't know anywhere right now where they're totally free of COVID-19. So if you look at a trip, not as a round trip, but if you look at a trip as being two one-way trips, you have to pre-test to get here, then by right, you should be pre-testing to go home, right? Okay? because there's an airplane in the middle where, you, where someone could be contaminated, okay? And that's an enclosed environment. And then of course, when you take the COVID-19 tests during your stay, your information should be shared, okay? So this information should be shared with your home country so they can feel comfortable with you coming back so you don't have to quarantine at home. So this is a full cycle. Now, if you look at this, there's a magic number here that says 30 days, okay, for this process here. When I traveled for business, when I had offices in Singapore, Hong Kong, Tokyo, Vietnam, and Malaysia, sometimes for business, I would have to be somewhere in the next, in the next 48 hours. So I didn't always have 30 days, okay? So this is okay for the casual tourist traveler but I think for business, we're gonna to have to adapt to this period because that's a not, not the normal business travel schedule. Okay. So anyway, I, I listed up here the steps for opening up. Now, what I wanted to do was define something here. And for some of us who've been in Homeland, we already know what these mean, but I think for, since this is a group of diverse individuals from all different countries and industries, I think it's good to identify the differences in definition between detection, tracking, and tracing, okay? So detection is just the ability to use sensors to establish whether someone is a person or group of interest, okay? A detector might be something like um, a fever check system. Since 88% of people, according to World Health Organization, um, show signs of fever uh, 72 hours after being 
catching COVID-19. So detection is just a way to sense who's of interest. The next part is tracking. If someone has a contagious disease, we have to track that person to make sure that they're contained properly. Okay, you can't just detect them and then let them out to the public and contaminate other people, right? Okay, it's, 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 a, it's a contagious disease, it's a pandemic. So we have to have a way to track. So tracking is tracking the individual. Now, what some people do is they use the word tracking and tracing together. But tracing is something totally different. So if someone has COVID-19, tracing means I want to know who that person comes into contact with. Okay? So when someone says, I have a device that can track you on your phone, that device doesn't normally trace. Because that device or that app on the phone will not tell you if you came into contact, you know, with someone two days ago or a week from now. So tracking and tracing are different activities. Okay, now um, in Europe and parts of the world, uh, you have something called a European Union General Data Protection uh, Regulations. It's, it's called GDPR. In the US, we have something called the Food and Drug Administration, FDA. And what's interesting is uh, when you do a temperature check on humans, that's an FDA test. Okay, Food and Drug Administration. If I was doing, using thermal cameras and doing a factory test on a manufacturing plant on a boiler, that's not an FDA check. So one of the things that's interesting here is there are rules when we deal with medical and human checks, okay, in terms of what is um, privacy, uh, covered by privacy laws in the United States. And I'm guessing that in every country, they have their own privacy laws. In the US, if I reveal someone's identity or any of the medical information to unauthorized people, it's a felony. It bears a um, $1,000 to $25,000 fine per occurrence. It's a breach of law, federal law. So it usually has jail term, and that person can lose their license. So a lot of people are converting these um, thermographic cameras, okay, with tracking systems, but they don't have privacy built in. And they're having security guards look at these things. Um, that's a felony in the US, okay? So I just wanna, you know, make sure we understand when I talk about technology, yes, there is technology that can accommodate some of the basic things, but you have to use it as applied to the regulations of that industry. In this case, the FDA, okay? And in the earlier session today, in fact, someone asked, um, if I'm a business owner with a restaurant and I do a fever check and someone has a fever and I turn them away, okay? Do I have compliance issues? Because I did an FDA check and I turned away someone who's potentially a contagious person into the general public? And the answer is, when, when, we, when we learned HIPAA compliance or FDA compliance, the way we learned it was, if you're going to do a medical check, you're responsible for reporting the medical information. Okay, so there is liability when you do a, a fever check. And most people in travel don't think of it this way. They think of it as I'm going to protect my venue. But if it's, a, it's a, if it's a contagious disease, you have to look at protecting as well the community. Okay, so uh, we're getting to the point now where we're kind of getting some definitions out of the way. And this is probably the last set of definitions I'll throw out tonight. Okay, so you might have heard the terms geofencing or smart city. And today we're talking about safe bubble. And, and what's the difference? And I'll just tell you where these terms came from. Uh, geofencing came from a term where people use uh, wireless internet or Wi-Fi or their cell phone to do push marketing, 
okay, based on your location. It's called location-based marketing. So if you happen to pass by a store, the store saw that you're on a cellular network or Wi-Fi network, they would send an advertisement to you, okay, um, whether or not you opted in. So that was geofencing. And that was one of the ways that um, free Wi-Fi, wherever you were at Starbucks or whatever else, made money. That's how they did that. They did push marketing. Okay. Smart City was the extension of geofencing. And that's the inclusion of what I'll call transportation linked with Internet of Things, linked with venues, okay, and um, other types of it's what I'll call smart grid or smart home activities, okay? So smart city actually includes what I would call the linking of transportation with venues and shopping, okay? With public governance and public safety. So part of smart city is smart home, okay? We can control your lights and your, your air, air conditioner and uh, your appliances from uh, over the net. Um, Smart grid might be you could, um, uh, if, you know, control your utilities and make it more efficient. Internet of Things basically says you could, you know, connect uh, GoPros and other devices that you wouldn't normally attach to Wi-Fi, including your refrigerator. Okay. So what is the last one? Safe Bubble. Safe Bubble is the integration of what I would call Smart City with applications for creating county to county bubbles, okay, which is a common operating picture and shared database, combined to state to state bubbles. Within, in the US, that would be like FBI. If you're doing interstate, you're going to the FBI, okay, and they have a managed common operating picture, okay. And if you're doing country to country common operating picture, okay, that would be something that's done through Interpol. Now there are different exchanges for data between just a state, which is maybe handled by the Department of Health, and then state to state, which is handled by the FBI, or maybe CIA and CDC, and then country to country, which is handled through the national law enforcement systems tied to Interpol. All of those have to be considered if you, depending on the type of safe bubble you're building. So why use Wi-Fi for bubble? Well, first of all, most devices speak Wi-Fi. My refrigerator does not have a SIM card, but my refrigerator talks Wi-Fi. In fact, 98% of all the Super Bowl communications was done using Wi-Fi, including ordering a hot dog from the stands, finding my seats, and texting um, my uh, you know, other, other people in the stands across the uh, stadium. Wi-Fi also complements cellular, okay? And Wi-Fi is also uh, has, uh, in the case of what we built in Hawaii, we built a mobile Wi-Fi internet-based system. The other things that you can do with Wi-Fi is you can aggregate venues together seamlessly so it's not proprietary like other wireless systems. And then you can add different types of encryption. And uh, of course, it's lower power, therefore, Many people say it's safer than cellular. And lastly, of course, they've added additional frequencies in the six gigahertz range. So Wi-Fi makes an ideal way to create a country to country bubble because all devices talk Wi-Fi and all countries run Wi-Fi. And it's all the same frequency. It's also a good venue, a good, a good way to track airport to Waikiki travel bubble, which is what we call the tourist zone because we can actually create a dedicated private network in that bubble, okay? So we can ensure GDPR privacy. And then of course, all hotels have Wi-Fi. Our goal was when we built our system, since our system has Wi-Fi that can reach over a mile to your cell phone, we can now extend your hotel stay and extend you out to the beach or the malls or the shopping areas, okay? and you won't lose tracking and tracing. So uh, one of our Japan partners gave me this picture, so I'm gonna use this picture. 
and uh, it, it just shows a bubble, okay? It shows a single sign-on system that from Japan, you can connect up with Hawaii. Yeah, you're gonna have to work with an airline in the middle, okay? But the database for analytics can then be shared with, you know, the FBI, Interpol, whatever else we need to make sure we have uh, control over tracking and tracing for contagion disease. Okay. Um, now I'm going to simplify it one way in terms of data. Because I know I talked about Interpol and the FBI. I don't want to get into too much confusion here. But if I were transferring money from Hawaii to the mainland, mainland U.S., I would use a bank. And the bank has an exchange for national transactions if i were transfer if i were transferring money to japan from us dollar to the yen okay i would go through a different exchange to do that okay just consider this when you have contagion disease information if you're doing local exchange national exchange or international exchange you have different exchanges and processes that you have to follow, okay? So I'm trying to simplify it that way rather than have you think of all these different complex things about data. So what does SGB, Sun Global Broadband, have to offer? Well, we start off with a anti-contagion suite that detects your face mask. Because they're saying that the face mask is one of the key elements for preventing contagion between people. Then we add something here called a fever check. Since 88% of all people who have a fever or have COVID-19 within 72 hours display a fever, including our President Trump, okay? So if someone has a fever, we have to contain them. So now we have to understand, you know, how do we socially distance them? So our system actually measures if you're six feet apart. Okay, and then if it's if they've been in an area and contaminated a number of people, we have to make sure we evacuate and contain them appropriately. Okay, and in each area uh, with a contagion, we have to determine who has access to that area and who doesn't. So we use actually facial analysis and analytics to determine who has access to an area. So we call this our anti-contagion suite. Okay, now we can also add in capability to detect noise as well as smell. So we have appropriate response for any type of events that happen at a venue or in a tourist zone. For example, um, if someone falls down, it could be they trip, it could be they have you know, COVID-19 and they're, uh, they can't breathe, okay? Or it could be they were shot, okay? If you have behavior and analytics, you have to be able to hear, okay, the gunshot, because each one of those scenarios has a different response on who would be the first responder. So we have, um, interesting enough, we have the solution set for European GDPR. And our solution set, like I said, does PPE detection, social distancing. Uh, we do the fever check as a, um, a detector. We can do imagine, imagine, uh, evacuation management and security. And it's with the database that's created is coordinated with Interpol and the FBI national law enforcement system. The system you use has to have the right credentials to be linked to the international law enforcement. Okay. Then, of course, we have the things that everyone's marketing out there e wallet services. Um, but we also have a unique system to link indoor Wi-Fi to outdoor beaches and e-wallet services that turn on the COVID-19 tracker. So this is one that we, uh, one slide that's actually created by one of our partners who does all the indoor Wi-Fi at the hotels. And we're now in the process of extending the lobbies out to the beaches because who wants to spend 10 grand to bring their family to Hawaii to sit in a hotel room, right? They want to see the blue skies, the white sandy beaches, and dip their toe in the, uh, you know, the Pacific Ocean, right? So, let's see. Oh, 
Okay. And these are other types of tracking devices that we're working with a uh, number of vendors on. And really, all of these things um, are really tools that were done in Smart City, but now we're extending them so that we're now calling it part of the, you know, the safe bubble. Okay, so pending market relationships, we're working with Japan, we're working with the Philippines, working with Las Vegas, and working with Native American tribes. And uh, we'd love to work with South Africa, uh, Cuthbert, as well as you know Nepal and other areas of the world that's on this call. Okay, so Thanks. kind of a, as a recap and benefits, the goal of all of our travel industries is we want to reopen for business safely. Okay, uh, after seven years of lockdown, we want to re-energize the business. Seven months, not seven years yet. Seven months. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. It seems like seven years. <laughs> it does. It does. It does. <laughs> Okay, in fact, I've gained five pounds sitting in my, <laughs> my living room, okay, conducting business. <laughs> okay, yeah. re-energize our business for profitability and morale, okay. Um, encourage safety among employees and employers, especially since pandemic is not covered by insurance. We wanna, we wanna encourage, if we're gonna be adopting new tools, let's become digitally efficient, okay. Um, and then let's become leaders in how to get the markets uh, re-energized using data analytics and building stronger ecosystems. So I want to thank you for your time today. Um, the goal was to share some of my experiences that we had when we implemented Homeland Security. Um, it's a complicated subject, not because uh, the technology is so complicated. It's a complicated subject because in a tourist business, you have to deal with holistically, okay? Because if you, if we traded COVID-19 like a terrorist, okay? In a terrorist attack, you have to account for every point of entry, right? In something like a virus, whether it's SARS, H1N1, or anthrax, there's multiple points of entry. Therefore, you can't go with point solutions. You have to come up with a comprehensive solution. And if you miss one point, because the virus grows exponentially, one person can contaminate a thousand. The same space it takes to contaminate one, okay? You have to contain it with automation. You can't possibly manually track and trace. People don't think exponentially and no one has perfect recall. If someone called me and says, Ed, you've been in Hawaii for nine days, you have COVID-19. Who did you talk to? Who did you see? Where did you go? What did you eat for the last nine days? Uh, at age 65, I just made 65 this month, qualifying for Medicare, <laughs> okay? I got problems remembering three days ago what I had for breakfast. <laughs> oh, no, that's... <laughs> okay, so there's a human factor in all of this. The good thing is there is a technology that exists to create the bubble. I've shared basically the essential things that must be implemented to stay resilient, okay? Not launch and close down and launch and close down, which is false starts, okay? And it's, it's, it's doable at a, at a, in, a, you know, in a small enough space without being excessively expensive. Okay. So I want to thank you again, and I will open up for questions. And um, hey, Jurgen, I was able to cut it down briefly in time. So it gives a little bit more time. No, no, I, I, know it's, I, I know it's very involved, and, uh, <laughs> it, uh, but it's an interesting subject. So... Talib, uh, uh, let him go first, and uh, of course. Thank you. Hey, Ed, you might just mention one thing um, about oh. all the back pressure, about all the back pressure that's coming from different countries, and what's just happened here in the last twenty-four hours with Hong Kong and Singapore, and how it relates to this. Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> by back pressure, that means there's a lot of um, angst and pain, economic decline as well as an un unemployment in, ter in terms of encouraging 
uh, ways to open up. Uh, what's happening in Hong Kong and Singapore, which are two of the largest financial centers in Asia, okay, and the ASEAN region, is they've created a financial, or they've created a, a bubble between Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, especially to link their two financial centers. So they've taken their financial bubble and extended it into a travel bubble, okay? We've taken our smart city bubble and extended it to a safe travel bubble. So what I'm, what the, the encouraging thing here is you can start with whatever you have. If you have the right consultant and expertise, okay, and the willpower to implement change. So that's what countries are now doing because um, I'll just say industry sometimes is more creative than government. No, that, that's for sure. And uh, yeah. Tal uh, Talib, you had a, a, a comment or a question. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I have to leave in 10, 15 minutes. That's why I have to say what I have to say now. Now, Edward, thank you so much. I think this is a great work you've done. I've always been a believer in bubbles. Actually, when we were working with Stellar in it, with ATB, African Tourism Board, Cathbert knows this, we created this concept of uh, Corona resilient zones, which is basically what you're talking about. Create a zone, not the entire country, but a zone within the country mm -hmm. that is safe and connected with another zone that is safe and study everything that's in between. You've worked all the details very well. I'm very, very impressed with that, Edward. But I have three comments to make here. Mm -hmm. Number one is we'll be fooling ourselves if we think that when we open up, we're going to be safe. You know, opening up has risks, but it's risks that you have to take. Mm -hmm. I have traveled now from Jordan to Dubai. I saw my children there, came from Dubai to Spain, and I went exactly through the steps that you're talking about. So most of the world is doing that. Tested 72 hours before boarding, before getting on the plane, tested before boarding. We boarded, the plane was safe, it's okay. Actually, the ventilation system on the plane, many people don't know, you know this probably. It's much better than any ventilation system in any indoor place because the, the amount of oxygen that goes into the plane forms 92% of the air. So it's, it's, not, it's not a problem. Seven, eight hours is not a problem enough on a plane and it should be widely spread between people. Now, when I came to Spain here, I'm, I'm living in the south of Spain now mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's quite pleasant here. So, but the, the point is this, when I left Jordan, we were having only 20, 25 cases every day. Now Jordan has opened up, it's gone to 3000 cases a day, Im immediately after that, because there's no way you could, you could open up without getting the risks of getting your, your own people, your employees and your own people contaminated. So that's, that's something that's very important what you're doing. But the second thing is what we're missing here is, is an element you mentioned very briefly. We call it, they call it digital nomads. You've heard of probably. Yes. I think Hawaii is a very typical place to go, do good for that. Because what's happening now, I'm here as digital nomad. I'm working from, not from home, but from far away from home. It's beautiful. I can look at, if I look up there, I see the sea. I can show it to you. It's beautiful from my balcony. So what we should think about now in terms of destinations is long-term stay, not just a stay of one, two, three days or a week. We should stay, think of months of stay. Many, many companies, many people are working from far away. And the Caribbean is doing very well in this. I think Hawaii could do very well in this. If you could just make a deal with the hotels, instead of making packages for rent for one, two days, you make packages for two, three weeks or a month even. So you could fill your, your hotels with people that are wanting to go to Hawaii, but they don't know how to. These people are easier to control because they're going to be living with you for long periods of time. In Jordan, we also have the Dead Sea area, which is a wellness spa. Basically, it's a huge wellness spa with 10, 12 hotels there. So people come there for a month or two, not just for a day or two or three or whatever that may be. Because if you're going to go home, take the trouble of traveling and everything, you might as well stay longer in, in the place. You become part of that place. Hawaii is typically very, very, very suitable for something like this. So in marketing, please, please look at something like that. 
That's a very important thing. The third point I want to make is regarding tracing and tracking. I think our waiting for the vaccine is a vital endeavor. I don't think vaccine is going to solve any problem. I'm not going to take the vaccine if it comes. That's for sure. What I want is a treatment. So testing and testing and testing is the most important thing. We need to make sure who, what, what you are, what stage of, of the disease you're in. Do you have the disease or anything at all? And we need to do that quickly. I was very happy to see your, your steps of doing that before mm -hmm. 72 hours on the plane, when you land and everything, even when you, during your stay there, mm -hmm. especially if your stay is long. Yeah. I like that very much. So testing is much more important than the vaccine. In Korea, they're saying three stages, testing, tracing, and treatment. What mm -hmm. you need eventually is a treatment, not a vaccine. Some people are not gonna take the vaccine. So waiting for this vaccine is like waiting for Gadu, you know. Yeah. That's, these are the three points I wanted to make. Thank you so much. If you have any comments, please. Oh, yeah. Very insightful. In fact, um, some of the hotels in Waikiki are now looking at converting to condominium. <laughs> yes, yes, term condominium. Yes. Um, it's transitioning the industry. Um, now, years back, a group of us were working, we started the um, uh, project called Aloha Net from the University of Hawaii. We started the yes. internet. Yes. And, um, you know, I have black hair, but I'm, I'm, sh I'm sharing my age. <laughs> but, Me um, too. <laughs> um, so we've been, I've been a proponent of distance learning, telemedicine, digital nomadic, uh, nomad, even, you know, uh, remote commerce for years. Yes, yes. But it takes a pandemic to stop people and to look at a, a total paradigm shift in how they do things. You know, most people in their lives are running on auto, autopilot. Right? Yes. And uh, it's, we're creatures of habit. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think one, one of the um, people that was a developer in Hawaii, and I'm, I'm checking your time because I, uh, I want to make sure I get this in. Uh, he, was a, he was a developer in Hawaii, and his, his comment before was, Hawaii doesn't have to do anything really well when it comes to marketing because the blue skies and the fresh air, white sand and the blue water is enough to attract them no matter what. That's okay. not right. And now two months ago, we had a um, East meets West venture capital meeting. And his, his approach was totally different. He said, good for you, Hawaii. Okay. A world event created it so that you had to shut down and it gives you the time to reassess how you can be more efficient and productive. That's right. That's, and that, that's what I call the digitali digitalization of society. So um, uh, in a way it's a benefit, but we have to look at it that way. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. No, it's a, it requires a complete change of, of mindset. That's right. You're right. That's right. You're right. You're right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very insightful. Jorge, Jorge, <laughs> may I be excused? I have a doctor's appointment of course, in 10, of course. 15 minutes, uh, please. Thanks, thanks for joining. Appreciate it. No problem. No problem. Take care, Edward. Okay. Nice to meet Catherine. you. It's a pleasure. Take care. Okay. Bye, and, Catherine. Bye. And, and thank you. Uh, thank you very much. If anyone wanted to add something to it or you have a question, you can raise your hand. Just uh, click on chat or participants, I guess, and there's a blue hand you can raise. Um, in, in the meantime, I'm quite curious. I, I see uh, someone joining us from a place so remote, so far away, that there is no coronavirus. I didn't think this would happen. Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, there is Melissa Fowler, and I don't know if you can uh, want to say a few words, but she's joining us from a place, I think it's the most re remote place in the world, it's the island of St. Helena. What I understand is um, between Africa and South America and the Atlantic Ocean. And it's a, a British overseas territory. Melissa, uh, can you unmute yourself? I don't know if you have the opportunity, but I would love to hear a little bit more about how things are in St. Helena. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Welcome. How, how uh, is it going in St. Helena? To tell us a little bit more about it. It's a fascinating place. I've never been to it. I don't know if anyone here in this group ever visited it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, for St. Helena, 
We, um, life is very much normal on St. Helena. Um, obviously we don't have any cases of COVID-19. So nothing really has, has changed for, for us here on the island. Um, obviously there's be, um, it's been a restriction on our flight Keep service. Keep um, so Keep it that we're way. currently looking at how we can reopen for tourism again. So this is the reason why I'm joining your guys today. Wow. Uh, but now, but when it comes to tourism, I'm just curious, um, who's visiting St. Helena? How do you get there? Uh, I, uh, I, I think you um, opened an airport recently, right? Your airport opened recently? Yeah, that's right, yes. Yeah, so you can visit um, St. Helena by joining, linking up um, via Johannesburg. Right. So we only have one flight um, at, the, at the moment, which runs on every Saturday. Um, and you, so, that, so you join from Johannesburg. So our main markets, well, at the moment is Europe. So um, yes. And oh. then right now we have a flight, a, a repatriation flight happening um, once every month um, from the UK. Wow. And, uh, and St. Helena is part of the UK, is that correct? Yeah, so we are British Overseas um, Territory. Um, we are, we, are, we um, are famous for our uh, Napoleon. Um, I don't know if you know, but he was exiled to St. Helena. Yes. So, yeah, so our, our visiting clientele is, yeah, the, the, the French market, of, of course. Um, but then one of our, our biggest um, highlights is our, our marine. Um, our marine product is huge on St. Helena because of the whale sharks. Um, yeah, so so we have a lot of divers coming to St. Helena. Wow. It, it's very, it, I'm, I'm so sorry to get you in there, but it's, it was so fascinating when I saw your, um, you're joining us. And, and we would love to do a session on St. Helena, know, know more about this. Maybe we can uh, communicate by email or something after the event and uh, yeah, please, yes, please, yes, that, yeah, that please, also, uh, please join us uh, on the rebuilding.travel so we can add another country. Then we have uh, 121 countries in categories. We'd love to have St. Helena as the 121. But but thank you, Melissa. I appreciate it. And um, thank you. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I know we 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 have uh, we're now um, pretty much uh, getting over time, but uh, if there are any questions or any comments, uh, please um, raise your hand so we can uh, get this in. Uh, there, there was a question from Gisau Rosala, Rosala, and I don't know where Gisau is. Uh, are you there? Do you want to verbally ask it? You can unmute yourself, Gisau. Sure, yeah. So I'm in Honolulu. Hi, everyone. Where Hi, are you are totally. <laughs> yes. uh, so basically, um, I was curious about the bubble because uh, I think uh, as uh, there are so many different countries with different access and also Wi-Fi and the digital world that might be limited. Yeah. And then uh, the idea is if the routes for the traveling can also be uh, reconsidered in order to create shorter routes, yeah? So um, that is safer, yeah? And include that in the bubble plan, yeah? So that people come, they get, go to a certain area and then they will be going to the hotels, yeah? Um, so, I understand the digital part, but I think there is a lot of other things that can be considered. Maybe it is definitely it is. It will be a change in how the routes are right now. Yeah, but that that was something that I thought can make more sense. Also, when you're talking about efficiency, yeah, to uh, maybe support first the shorter routes to travel or uh, plan more to bring in from those areas it doesn't matter where we are yeah so i think the shorter travels they give us maybe the ability to start in a safer way and then see what the uh, uh large so the uh, uh, the this 
the distance can have an impact on the traveling. Yeah, so that's the, I think that would be something to consider. But by the way, when you're saying that distance, are you referring to the, um, the size of the bubble? Well, um, I think the bubble, how the way you were describing that, that is, yeah, so um, that is more digital. Um, I was bringing in the idea of the travel route where um, tourists are coming in, yeah, and then to redirect that from, uh, from the travel time, yeah, so from the start point, how to bring the uh, uh, passengers in, the tourists, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe encouraging more short uh, distance travel than the long distance travels. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, tourists are, uh, I mean, it, it will always depend on how you market a country or um, a destination. That's how we got, I mean, I used to live in Europe. Yeah. So a lot of European, they go within Europe in Italy, Spain, uh, Portugal. Yeah. So these are short distance. And I think it's, it's much easier to create a safer bubble for the short distance travel than the long distance travels. And I think I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because this was actually an ongoing discussion we also had on this uh, forum. And I know Taleb who just left us is a big supporter of uh, regional and domestic tourism to restart the industry. I know Cuthbert and with the African Tourism Board, that also has been a main discussion um, how to restart tourism first on a domestic and a regional basis. Now, when it comes to us here in Hawaii, everything is long distance. Even if you go to San Francisco, you have to be on the plane for five hours. Um, so unfortunately, um, unless you're talking about inter-island travel, uh, that probably, or you wanted to go to uh, to Popokea or someplace uh, from yeah. Honolulu, you know, it's not uh, too much of a domestic <laughs> tourism here. <But> yes, <laughs> that is correct, yeah. So, of course, we are in the middle of Pacific, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in general, I think you have a very valid point. Um, and, and for the mainland US, I think road travel, many say it is maybe safer than air travel. Um, airlines would probably say that's not true. Um, but uh, you can, of course, distance yourself. You're in charge. You're in your car, and and that's that's a very good uh, good point, um, mm -hmm. I, I believe. Um, yeah. Are there any more comments or or questions? I see here we have a gentleman from um, or Nina, not a gentleman, a lady from uh, Zambia, telling us that Zambia is open for tourists uh, for tourists. I know we we've, we've heard this um, uh, at I think at one of our last uh, couple of last uh, sessions. Uh, from the uh, Zambia Tourism Board uh, that is this planned uh, destinations that are opening up. We have uh, heard it from Tanzania, Peter Bryan, he gave us a fascinating um, concept for his region, which was Mafia Island he, uh, in Tanzania. And I know Zambia uh, is, um, uh, had plans, but I didn't know it already opened for tourism. Nina, are you still there? Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about opening means. Do you really have international tourism coming into Zambia already? Good morning or good evening, depending where you are. <laughs> um, yes, yes um, so you can travel in as a tourist right now. Um, problem we are facing is that um, there's very few direct flights getting into Zambia. So people have to go via South Africa or other countries and there's too little planes coming in at the moment. But there are a few coming in. The first tourists have been there. The first uh, mobile safaris are going on. The first um, short-term visitors for the Victoria Falls have been there. But it's, it's very little at the moment. So you have to have a valid COVID-19 test when you enter the country. It can't be older than three days. And um, for traveling back, as you have to usually change airport in Johannesburg or in Addis Ababa or another country and going back to most of the home countries, people then usually are required to have that same COVID test to go home again. So there are several test centers in the country, which for a fee, give you a test within 24 to 48 hours. 
So it's kind of a similar concept uh, what yeah. we have uh, doing here in Hawaii and uh, are flying people flying are there flights into Livingston already or you have to go through Lusaka? We actually had the first flight to Livingston about 10 days ago, which was welcomed with a lot of dancing and drumming. Oh, I think that's where I'm, uh, where we met Felix Trailer. He's a good friend. You probably know him. He's the head of the Zambia, Zambia, Zambia Tourism Board. I know him for many years. And he had his family on vacation when he called in. And I think that's where he was. He was at the falls, I guess. Yeah. And uh, yeah. whoever hasn't been to Zambia, it's a beautiful country to visit. Um, I was in Zambia last time at the UNWTO General Assembly. This must have been like seven, eight years ago, and it was jointly held at the time with Zambia and Zimbabwe. And the bridge was open, so you can freely uh, drive from Livingston to Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe. And, and I stayed at the Royal Livingston. What a beautiful hotel. So <laughs> uh, yes, it's Zambia is open. It's definitely going to get on my bucket list once we get travel again. Thank you very much for your, <laughs> for your yeah, feedback. Please come. Um, we can't wait to welcome you. Eh? No, and I can't wait to get there. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful place. Actually, in, in Zambia is when I met the Minister of Tourism at the time from San Marino, who just joined us, as I said. Uh, we, we, kind of a funny story. I was sitting overlooking uh, the beautiful gardens and the falls from the hotel I was staying. And, uh, and I just got up to throw something out. And, and this guy I didn't know just sits in my seat. And I said, excuse me, you know, I was sitting here. And I almost got into a little argument and fight. And he was the Minister of Tourism from um, San Marino. We became friends. So uh, at least I stood my ground. He stood his ground. We were fighting over the feet, seat, but it's a beautiful place. And uh, thank you so much, Nina, for, for, for joining. Jürgen, you probably don't remember, but one time we met at ITB and my then hus my husband gave you an invitation for a walking safari in the Mosiotonia National Park. So that invitation. Oh, wow. Then. So when you come, just give me a call. I, I do that. Thank you very much, okay. Nina. Cheers. Okay. Okay, we have uh, Raid. Uh, I know he's joining us from uh, either Riyadh or Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. Welcome, Raid. Salam alaikum. How are you? Salam alaikum. Good morning, Mr. Jurgen, and good morning to everybody all over the globe. And I'm very glad to see that finally your effort uh, to rebuild travel and tr tourism is succeeding. I would like to congratulate the state of Hawaii, one of the beautiful places on the planet to open up uh, tourism. And uh, that's really great news. Mm -hmm. And we pray for God that it will be a safe tourism uh, for everybody to enjoy that uh, uh, beautiful destination. Uh, uh, we hear a lot about Hawaii and uh, Honolulu and uh, Waikiki and uh, all the beautiful islands. And uh, we are very happy to see the coming back and the opening of tourism uh, in Hawaii. And uh, actually, as you know, uh, I've been with IATA and Saudi Airlines and then I started a VIB travel club for the royal family in Saudi Arabia. So I traveled to over 150 cities and uh, beautiful destination, all the luxury destinations around the globe. And uh, actually, I would like to send uh, through this uh, platform and through you, Mr. Jurgen that we must promote Hawaii in the MENA region and especially to Saudi Arabia uh, because I handled many VIBs going to Europe, Asia, and the US. Uh, but uh, Hawaii always in our perception is far away. So <laughs> thanks, to the <laughs> thanks to the technology, now it's connecting everybody together. And we are uh, ready through you, Jürgen, to develop uh, maybe some uh, workshop for uh, B2B or B2C to VIBs uh, to promote this beautiful destination. Uh, once again, 
I like to congratulate our uh, friends, the state of Hawaii, the tourism uh, promotion board, and everybody working in that industry. Hey, thank you, Raid, and and I think you know you probably put music in the ear of our common friend Jonathan in Los Angeles. Jonathan uh, leads uh, heads Saudi Airlines in Los Angeles, and uh, we're we're all good friends. And um, I know I worked with Jonathan a little bit. He's a good client, and Saudi Airlines has been a good client um, of my publication. And uh, we worked on student groups. Uh, students um, is a huge business uh, studying in California, I think, uh, for students in Saudi Arabia. And uh, that might be a really good opportunity. Our two good, excellent universities um, have uh, live on international uh, uh, students, especially in the marine life. I think Hawaii is uh, leading. And now with Saudi Arabia opening um, Jeddah and opening to Western tourists and open, opening one of the most beautiful diving and resort areas in the world, there is a travel bubble, I think, between Hawaii and uh, Saudi Arabia, what shouldn't be underestimated. So thank you very much, uh, Raid. I appreciate it uh, that thank you're thank you. calling it. I would love to uh, talk to you separately about how we can enhance that travel bubble between Saudi Arabia and Hawaii. Um, yes, wouldn't that be something, yeah? <laughs> yeah. That, that's great. And yes, we can have a separate uh, meeting. Uh, and uh, I would appreciate uh, uh, my friend uh, Jürgen to organize that. Yeah, and we can I can see a big potential. Because as Jürgen said, at one time, uh, we had more than 130,000 students studying in the US. My daughter now is in San Francisco. And uh, I know many Saudi students, they are in California, which is very close uh, to Hawaii. I think it's about five hours flight. Yeah, it's about five hours, yes. Okay, that's great. And uh, we can arrange also uh, with Saudi Airlines and maybe with uh, other American airlines to make a special uh, bilateral agreement to promote the destination. I don't know which uh, airline is more strong uh, in Hawaii and have more frequent flights, but uh, Saudi is part of the uh, alliances, the global alliances, I think the Star Alliance. No, not and Star, don't, don't tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> Different Sorry, alliance. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's a Sky Team, it's Sky Team. And actually, Del Delta Airlines is part of Sky Team. And Delta Airlines yeah, flies sorry, actually connects, yeah, connects to Hawaii. So there's, there's definitely a good opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and also, I developed the Saudi Airline frequent flyer. Uh, uh, membership program called Al Fursan, but that was about 25 years ago. So we we have a, a good database that we can work out with Saudi, uh, and then we can do special, uh, you know, mail shots or whatever that we can arrange. But definitely, Hawaii is being a fascinating uh, destination. Uh, for Saudis, and they would love to go there, but uh, we need to give them more information. That's very important. No, and, and that's and that's great, Raid. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you everyone for being part of uh, this event. We're now managed to be 16 minutes over time. <laughs> it is good. We will post everything online. We're going to send everyone a copy of both videos and presentations. We had one from this morning and we had this one. And uh, so you, and we also will uh, connect you to Edward if you have any questions. Um, and uh, I encourage everyone who has not registered at rebuilding.travel, please do, it's free. And uh, we will, so we, we can invite you to more sessions. All our sessions are also free, so you cannot lose. So from, from this end of, of the world, and uh, we say uh, aloha and uh, mahalo. That means thank you for attending. Uh, mahalo, Edward, uh, for, for being much. a guest. And uh, we hope pleasure. to see you see you again soon. And uh, favorite aloha.
Hawaiian sign is all the shaka, right? <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Raitris, Ra Ra uh, real quick, I know uh, we said we're going to stay longer. Talib had to leave. He had a doctor's appointment, but I will call you on WhatsApp. Okay, okay. guys, you have, a, uh, you have a good night and good day. And uh, make sure you read Ichobo News. We're going to have another story on this as well. Aloha. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.